Hello and welcome to the Sunday version of The Next Level. I'm Tim Miller, uh, here with my BFF forever, Jonathan V. Last. Uh, we have an awesome guest coming for you today, uh, Congressman out of the Dallas suburbs, Colin Allred. Uh, Congressman Allred was an NFL linebacker. Uh, he played at Baylor all four years, went undrafted, and then gutted it out through training camp, made it into the NFL just based on his own fortitude, testicular fortitude, internal mental fortitude, whatever it is. And uh, it's a great interview. We do. He's also on the uh, oversight committee right now. Um, and so we ask him about that. Um, we asked about Ted Cruz. Uh, we talk about his football career and his time in Congress. JVL, what would you think? Uh, he's amazing. What mm -hmm. a cool guy and a smart guy and a genuine guy, too. He's incredibly candid. Uh, like <laughs> Normally, politicians are not candid. Uh, and he just really told us what he thought about stuff. He was great. And I found out afterwards, he DM'd me, he had strep throat the whole episode. He had strep throat, oh, so he got it out throat. fifty, yeah, fifty five minutes with us, you know, listening to my BS, and and he and he uh, he stuck kids with gave us. It to him. So it's going to be great. Every week, by the way, for folks who are new to the Sunday Show, every week we're going to do a little bit of politics at the top before we get to our special guest interviewer. Some weeks the interview is going to be more about stuff outside of politics, and we'll talk more about politics at the top. This week, since we had a congressman, we did quite a bit of politics. So I thought that maybe we just start really quick, JVL, with something a little, some little lighter fare. Maybe a little lighter fare. A little I don't know. Pudding fingers. Yeah, uh, yeah. A little pudding finger content. Tiny D, meatball Ron. Um, have you seen this video uh, that's been going around this morning? Uh, it, I guess it went around in 2018, but I just I must not have paid as close attention to the 2018 Florida governor's race as I thought, and it's been resurfaced uh, 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 here on Friday morning when we're taping this. And uh, have you have you seen it yet? It's about Ron DeSantis's name, uh, how he pronounces his own it. name. Okay, Hit let's, me with it. Sebastian, let's just do this. Let's just do it live. Uh, I am Ron DeSantis. I'm Ron DeSantis. Uh, I am Ron DeSantis. I'm this is Governor Ron DeSantis. Hello, this is Governor Ron DeSantis wishing everyone a Merry Christmas. What? Hi, this is Governor Ron DeSantis, and I want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Hi, I'm Governor Ron DeSantis. Is that a deep fake? I, I, I literally, I was, I saw it on Twitter and I thought it might be a deep fake before I suggested we discuss it. So I went back and I found a YouTube clip, a news clip, a legit news, not fake news from 2018, where they had it. Ron, Ron DeSantis doesn't know how to pronounce Ron DeSantis. Well, see, changed. here's the thing. Here's the thing. Ron DeSantis loved Paul Ryan and loved Ukraine and wanted to go in there and gut Social Security and Medicare and kick all those old folks off of it because of the free markets. But Ron DeSantis, he is an America firster who is absolutely hates the globalist cucks and is never going to touch your entitlements, dear old people. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, you know, I, I get it. I Look, I, after a few bourbons... I slip into say, a little bit of a southern I've draw. Changed. I do. I've changed yeah. so much. I don't even say my name the same way. Yeah, I've <laughs> I've, I've been known to pick up a Louisiana accent um, that's not authentic, uh, and and so I get your own name. That's a little weird. It's a little odd in your in your forties to decide that D. Santis. Was he worried about the Tiny D nickname? Did he first see that coming, do you think? And he was like, I don't want to be Tiny D, so we're going to go with Dust Santos. The other theory from the video I watched, Casey, the wife, the wife might not have liked DeSantis. Because hmm. on her videos, it's always been Dust Santos. Hmm. I don't know. It's odd. It's it's a little we can, I mean, It's not the biggest deal in the world, you know. It's surely not the same as like Donald Trump putting out a video doing Henry Wallace, like we should blame Americans <laughs> instead of the commies. Kind of, it's like it's not as big a deal as that, of course, but it's weird. You'd, we'd have to concur. Well, it's of a piece with the idea that he isn't who he says he is, right? And this right. is, I, I would say, this is Trump's main line of attack: is that this guy over here, he's just copying me. You can't trust him. He's just, you know, look at what he was saying about Paul Ryan just five minutes ago. And I don't know. You know, this is Amanda and I, Amanda Carpenter, uh, and I talk about this all the time, which is on the one hand, you can see how arguments would find purchase with, with voters. But on the other hand, a lot of politics is just id. And if voters like him, they'll, you know, you, you could shoot a guy on Fifth Avenue and they won't care. 
Yeah. All right. Well, this is this is going to be a really great interview. Stick around for Colin Allred. If you are a if you're an audio listener of this podcast, go to YouTube. Subscribe also on YouTube for us. Comment on YouTube. Like it. Uh, we're, we're you know we're trying to reach the masses out there. You know on the World Wide Web. Uh, so go to YouTube and subscribe as well. Uh, you're going to really enjoy this. Stick around to the end. Uh, Colin does assess how he would do in a wrestling match with Jim Jordan. That's something mm. that you're not going to want to miss. And uh, we'll see you back here on Wednesday uh, with me, JVL, and Sarah, as we do every week. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark's Next Level Podcast. I'm Tim Miller with my best friend, JVL, and my aspiring best friend, Congressman Colin Allred of the uh, Dallas, uh, outside of Dallas District. Congressman, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Tim. And good to see you, JVL. Hey. <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be so good. I've been excited to do this. So I, this the origin story of this podcast is I was watching you just tomahawk dunk on the dude that uh, uh, was the uh, test uh, the testifier, the special expert that the Republicans picked for the Weaponization Committee, who I guess had great insight supposedly into the FBI, despite the fact that he hadn't worked at the FBI since like 1986 right. uh, when they were using pagers. And uh, and I was I was just getting a huge kick out of that. And so I thought it'd be fun to have you on. Uh, we can do a little bit of that and then talk a little bit about football uh, in, in the spirit of our Sunday podcast uh, to get off the news a little bit. So my first question for you is, I notice you don't have any hair. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, now that you're on this committee with Jim, with Jim Way to Jordan, butter him up. That's great. Yeah. Really yeah. get the guests all, <laughs> yeah. all yeah, just, Thanks, yeah, Tim. Just, yeah, just get you comfortable. Um, That's right. I notice you don't have any hair. You're on this committee with Jim Jordan. Just wondering how you're kind of dealing with that since you can't pull or twist your hair, which is what I do when I'm like stressed out. I like do Nicorette gum, screaming internally, Ujjayi breaths. Any, any tips for dealing with Jim Jordan? How, how's that going? You know, Tim, I actually think that uh, all of those would be nice to be able to do. Um, I, I'm, I'm not kidding. I, I try to remind myself how nonsense this committee is. Uh, and that normal folks back home are, this is not why I was elected. This is not what they're not paying attention to this, that mostly what we're going to be there to do is to just try and introduce some facts into a fact free environment. Uh, and, you know, but even saying, having said that, uh, I'm not somebody who is super online. Um, and so during some of these committees, and you, I think you heard me say that, Tim, I'm sometimes having a hard time following the conspiracy theories because there, there's so much you know, specific terminology that you really have to be down the rabbit hole on it, yeah. you know, and like my staff will try to prep me on it. Uh, but I'm like, wait a second. So this is going back to how many years ago, you know, and <laughs> yeah. uh, and I don't know. I mean, the, the, the funny thing is, if Democrats were ever organized enough to be able to pull off anything like the conspiracies that they accuse us of, uh, then we would be a much stronger political force in, in this country, you know, and uh, we just don't have that. Well, it's my burden to be aware of all of these conspiracy theories because I spend time listening to Steve Bannon's podcast. So, you know, our listeners don't have to. So I, I think sometimes I'm down the rabbit hole. So maybe just to start for the listeners who, like you, are not very online, uh, can you just give us the Reader's Digest version of what the Republicans are ostensibly arguing yeah. for this yeah. oversight committee and, and kind of what your role is in pushing back on that? Yeah, so the, the the premise of the committee is that the Biden administration and the previous aspects of the Trump administration, particularly the national security aspects, the FBI and, and others, uh, are, quote, weaponizing the federal government to attack and censor conservatives. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting theory, uh, particularly since a lot of this occurred during the Trump administration, especially what we've talked about so far. Um, but... Uh, also, you, you think know, the boss would have maybe done something about it, I guess, the right, boss. Right. right. Yeah. And also, I mean, it's, you know, the idea that, uh, there's some grand conspiracy, uh, and that, you know, it's not that they're not able to connect with enough voters to, to have won the last few elections. You know, it's not that, uh, their views are fringe views. It's just that they're being silenced or they're being targeted and, one of the interesting aspects of it is that many of the things that they accuse the Biden administration of doing or the FBI of doing are things that they have said themselves that they want to do, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, this is, it's, it's very much a projection. Every accusation is a confession type situation. Right, exactly. It's very yeah. much projecting, you know, this is what we would like to be doing. Um, unfortunately, we've not yet been successful in doing this, but, 
you know, I think it's a preview sh should Donald Trump return that, you know, this is a preview of the kind of the retribution to use his word, I think that, uh, that they would be seeking. Our role, I think, uh, is, is fairly straightforward. You know, you can't win an argument with people who don't believe in, in truth or who have a motivation that is, you know, outside of kind of a discussion, you know, that their, their motivation is totally different. So I think the way we see it and the way I see it is to just try and poke holes so that somebody who may be watching, who might be, you know, maybe falling under the sway of this, would question whether or not what they've been told is true. Maybe go find out for themselves whether or not, you know, it's really true that you know, Democrats are this bad or that, you know, the all of our national security agencies are mostly focused not on China, not on Russia, but on conservative Americans. Um, you know, just kind of poke some holes in that, and introduce some facts, understanding that the witnesses there are not going to admit to anything, that certainly my Republican colleagues on the committee are not going to back down from any of their claims. That's not what we're trying to do. And so it's one of the least productive, and it is the least productive committee I've ever been on. Uh, there's, there's nothing that's going to kind of come out of this. No productive legislation, nothing to help average folks, nothing to help people who are you know, trying to get by out there who are working hard. None of that. It's just going to be you know, partisan rancor. And to be honest with you, Tim, I think you know this about me. That's not exactly my, you know, my forte, but that's what we're doing. So, um, Do you hear from people in your district about this at all? Like, does any of it? Because we, you know, I think Tim coined the, the term, you know, a couple of years ago, that there was this Trump cinematic universe. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, dropping in to see the 15th Marvel movie if you've never seen any of the others. Yeah, right. You can't follow what's going on. You're like, who's Ant-Man? What's happening? Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's an aspect of like, the, the lovers, Peter Struck, who is that, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so when, I don't know, like you're, you're back in your district and you bump into somebody at the is it HEB or HEB? I don't know how you say H -E -B, that. HEB, yeah. But if, you know, yeah. so you bump into someone at the HEB, are, are they like, you know, hey, that that weaponization thing, you know, Congress, why aren't you doing more? Or does it just go right over their heads? Is this, uh -huh. is this basically content produced by the cinematic universe for the cinematic universe? Or is it playing at all to people? I really think it is. Uh, it's cable news fodder. And, and so folks who are maybe really plugged in on cable, but even, you know, Fox was cutting away apparently and not showing the committee because it was so boring and didn't have anything to deliver. Uh, and so honestly, my office gets a lot of calls during these hearings and they're almost all from outside of the district. Uh, they're not folks who I represent. Uh, they're just folks who are watching and who want to call and yell at a Democrat. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, I, I have yet to have a in-person conversation uh, about this. Um, you know, when I drop my kids off at their, their daycare, you know, nobody's coming up to me and be like, wow, you know, I'm really worried about the Twitter files, you know, like, uh, it's just, not <laughs> so. um, the, just kind of to strip this all down, um, uh, for people, when you talk about poking holes, it's gotta be kind of news uh, to the extent that anyone notices that this is happening. It has to be kind of news to black Americans, brown Americans, liberal <laughs> Americans that the FBI is actually biased <laughs> against conservatives, right? right? Like that's got to be breaking news that there's a lot yeah. of woke libs in the FBI. Um, that's yeah. a little bit of a, a kind of an interesting theory based if you know anything about the FBI or the history of the FBI. Yeah. Like, the Edgar Hoover is rolling over <laughs> in, in, his, uh, uh, in his grave, you know, three layers underneath hell. But, um, you know, I, I, I think you're right. I think it's also, it's hilarious for us because we actually offered, uh, we sent a letter to uh, Jim Jordan saying, you know, if you want to talk about how African-Americans are more likely to be audited by the IRS, we're happy to talk about that. Um, but they, they have not interested in that? taken us yeah. up on that. <laughs> is there anyone, is there a single person on that committee that is acting in good faith? Is there any, is like, has there been a single iota or piece of information that's made you think, yeah, we should look into that? Anything? I, I really, you know, I think you know that I'm, I try to be pretty, play it down the middle as much as I, I can. And I'll be honest with you, I have not heard anything that sounded even rational <laughs> so far. Now, I, I do think that generally speaking, we need to have a conversation as a society about our online discourse, about what, how does content moderation happen, uh, about how do we limit the like the impact of you know foreign adversaries trying to take advantage of our free platforms to influence our elections? 
And I wish we could have a productive conversation about that, where we try and you know, walk the narrow line there between what could be government overreach, um, if, you know, if you're, you're shutting down a story because you think it's a, a Russian op, uh, and maybe it's not, um, or uh, what kind of speech you know, is and is not dangerous and is acceptable on these platforms. As you know, they're not, they're not government platforms, they're, they're private institutions. Uh, and so there's a there's also a nexus there that which one are we which lines are we crossing? Is it First Amendment? Is it is it just you know the, the business values of that platform? That would be an interesting conversation to have. And I'm happy to have that conversation because, as you said, for African-Americans, this is something that is it comes up all the time. You know, a feeling uh, that, you know, the government uh, is, for lack of a better term, monitoring you. <laughs> you know, I got fr- I have friends who like. If they get a parking ticket, they're like, oh, they're after me. You know what I mean? It's the old Tom <laughs> Hanks Black Jeopardy skit. You know? Yeah. Like, Tom's yeah. making sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, how about yeah. even even uh, your former colleague, Tulsi Gabbard? She wasn't uh, she wasn't making sense and bringing up some, some really interesting concerns before the committee? I thought her testimony was embarrassing. And I think that she, she posited that she had done well in a debate where she'd gone up to Hillary Clinton and that it had not led to the online engagement that she'd expected because Google took down her ads <laughs> and like that kind of passed by. I think everybody kind of missed it. And I wrote it down. Like what did she really just say that? Cause it was, it was like, you know, droning on basically like, you know, five minutes of just kind of nonsense. I was like, wait a second. So you think Google decided that today's the day we're going after Tulsi Gabbard, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they were directed by someone. To go after Tulsi Gabbard, you know. I mean, yeah, Tulsi right. well, thought the, the big tech companies were the reason that she lost. I, I mean, right. I, the I Rothschild have an alternate group. So the Rothschild group was the one who sent the message through to the stonecutters, and the stonecutters <laughs> gave it to Google. I and... have an alternate theory. Maybe the Democrat from the Tucker Carlson wing of the Democratic Party wasn't like best suited to win a primary. Like you know, yeah. maybe maybe like you know, there was a lack of constituency there. Now, that's what that's one her? possibility. Do you have one, any theories one, of that? What's that? Do you have any theories on what happened to her? You know, I, I have a lot of folks have told me uh, that they are just shocked because, you know, she came in and I served with her for a term. She was running for other things the whole time. And then I think she just stopped coming to Congress <laughs> pretty much. Um, but, you know, there was always a feeling that she was a little bit you know, different and um, a little strange. And Tim, you've written about this, I think, extensively. And you all talked about this. For, there's certain kind of allure to this whole uh, authoritarianism mix or whatever you want to call it that can sweep in these kinds of personalities. Um, and, you know, there's a fine line in some cases almost between being like a contrarian, right, and, and, and being a conspiracy theorist. And, uh, and you know, I also though think that um, she saw that her path forward in the party was blocked and she's taking a, a totally different path that's you know, maybe financially more lucrative. And I, I think we always kind of discount that, right? Like yeah. that some of it is that you can believe it. And some of it is that it's got a paycheck attached to it. As Rupert Murdoch said in an email, sometimes it's not red or blue, it's green <laughs> for why he had Mike Lindell on air. That was a very uh, prescient, uh, a very insightful quote by Rupert. Okay. Um, that's the weaponization committee. I was hoping that maybe there was one thing in there that was legit, but I guess not. We'll keep monitoring. I, thank God. It's, I'm glad it's you, not me. Who has to sit in there with Jim Jordan? I get to watch, you know, when I when I want to punish myself and you know do some funny tweets. But you like literally have to be there for your job. So we, we appreciate your work on that. Oh, I want to do a little more politics before we get to football. Um, sure. You represent uh, W's district. I do. Yeah, he's a constituent. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a. I consider him a friend, actually. Yeah. Okay. So what what do we think? So we got W and Laura. Um, do you think you got two votes out of that household or just, just one in the last um, election? I, I actually think that they have not yet voted for me. <laughs> you don't think, you don't even think Laura? <laughs> Maybe Laura. Yeah. Maybe. I, I think Laura. They might not admit to it, but I, yeah. I, well, that's I, I bet a cookie yeah, that they gonna, voted for you, frankly. Say it. Um, yeah. no, w called me after I got elected and I, I didn't answer because I didn't recognize the number and he left a hilarious <laughs> voicemail <laughs> on my phone. I wish I had kept it. I, stupidly erased it what was the bit it was basically like you know it's like it's like you know it's like congressman you know uh congratulations and he's like you know it's like i'm not gonna be one of those constituents blowing up your phone and, and sending you a bunch of letters but uh let, let's get together you know and you know and, and so we we had a we scheduled a meeting and 
we, we it was supposed to be about a 30 minute meeting. I think we met for about an hour. Uh, and he was just so funny the whole time. And I'm a big baseball fan. I was a big Rangers fan. He was a former you know, Rangers owner. And so we talked a lot about that. Um, he talked about kind of the presidential, post-presidential speaking circuit. And he's like, you know, I believe in freedom of speech, but not anymore. <laughs> he's like, they got to pay me now. <laughs> <laughs> he slowly kind of morphed into the Will Ferrell caricature of him, yeah, like, yeah, in, yeah. in his post-presidential yeah. life. I got to spend a little yeah. time with him in 2016. Um, so I, the more, I, like, it is relevant, though. I, it's it's telling that, that W is there because you are, you're at, like, I think the beating heart, maybe the Atlanta suburbs is number one, but yeah. the Dallas suburbs is like the center of, of these voters that, that I've written about. We've written about the Bulwark that, called, that I call the Red Dog Democrats, yeah. right? People that are suburban, traditional Republicans, Bush voting Republicans. They live in big metros. A lot of times they live in red states and they might not be ready to identify themselves as Democrats yet, but like for mm-hmm. practical purposes, they are, right? Like they, they are not interested in the anti-woke stuff they're not like you know interested in the uh, hate trump you know they're not interested in the isolationism you know they they liked compassionate conservatism right like that was the draw for them so you've got a lot of those folks in your district so give us a little bit on the ground you know when you're talking to them when you're trying to nudge them over the line to say it's okay you know you can pull the blue lever this time like how are those conversations going and and do you think that there's still more you know, gettable folks there or, or, you know, just what's your sense for that? Yeah. Well, I try to start with values um, because I do think that these are folks, as you said, who they haven't really changed their politics. It's just politics has changed around them. Um, But they are hesitant to be considered a Democrat, like you said. I mean, they're not, they're not going to put a sign in their yard. Um, uh, But they, they have been, I think, deeply um, insulted in some cases by sort of the, the the bent of the Republican Party, that these are folks who are intellectuals with high-powered degrees, you know, they, you know, they read the Wall Street Journal. I mean, they, like they're, they don't, they're not going to just buy, you know, some conspiracy theory or, or go follow you down a rabbit hole. Uh, and that, that's not who they are. Um, and so with them, it's always been for me, number one, you know, push kind of like my story, which is that, listen, I grew up right here in this community. I know what we're like. I know kind of who we are. And that stuff that you're seeing over there from like the Trump wing, I know it's not us. Uh, I recognize that we're not going to agree on everything on a policy perspective, but we're going to agree, uh, I think, on the values. Uh, and it's been you know very effective. Uh, and I think you're right. Particularly the women um, are not going back. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it's it's not... You know, it's a political transformation that is complete. Now, I, I do think that we can do a lot better uh, as a party appealing to some of these, you know, men and, and making sure that they feel like they, we can be a, a home for them, a political home for them, too. Because I do think that they're looking around wondering, where do I belong, <laughs> you know, uh, and they can be scared off by, you know, uh, radical rhetoric or, uh, you know, things that are uh maybe blaming them for all of society's ills, you know, or something like that, you know, and, um, and that I think for us as a party, we need to be smarter about you know, welcoming those folks in. I think they have chosen to be with us in the last few elections because of the threat that Trump posed. Uh, but they've also chosen in many cases to vote, you know, for a Republican member of Congress, maybe, um, while they're voting for Joe Biden. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I think we need to do a better job making sure that we're not letting our, um, our kind of left flank be just who we're identified as. Uh, Do you think Ukraine the, is going to scare any of those guys back on side with Democrats? If, what, if the Republican the nominee, one? if the Republican nominee is somebody who says Ukraine is a territorial dispute, we shouldn't be involved at all over that. Is is that going to resonate with people at all, or is it is foreign policy just too hard to drive? Yeah, uh, like actually, no, these are voting? these are folks who care about foreign policy. Uh, they they care about foreign policy, at least in my district. And they're very pro supporting Ukraine. Uh, and they believe, you know, this is like a Reagan esque view, I think, you know, that yeah. we, we should stand up for freedom. Uh, the Russians are the enemy, you know, and uh, we, we have a valiant democracy fighting for its survival. I, you know, I, I saw that, um, uh, you know, Ron DeSantis, you know, kind of capitulated, I guess you could say, on, on Ukraine. And I thought, I mean, I was just like, that's not 
that's not the, the way, man. You know what I mean? Because maybe he believes that. Maybe, maybe that's true. I don't know. Uh, but I think that uh, the folks who I represent, the George W. Bush fans who, Tim, you know, when I was a little younger, they were driving around with those W stickers on the back of their car. Yeah, and now I, they're voting for me. You know? I had one. Yeah, but you did. I mean, <laughs> those, those folks, um, you know, they, they think that this is this is the right path and that we should continue to pursue it. Uh, and I don't, you know, I don't understand kind of the the impulse to, to, to back away from supporting a democracy that needs our help. I want one more about those men. I think you hit on this exactly right. And, and I think sometimes in the Democratic coalition, it's not like fashionable to be like, you know, who's an important uh, swing group that we need to reach out to is white college educated men in the suburbs. right? <laughs> like, but really, they are. And, and you were exactly yeah. right. And I think that a lot in the Joe Biden voter that he improved with was that voter, right, that, that couldn't come around on Hillary for whatever reason. And, and then they had four years of their wife, you know, wagging their finger at him and being like, this, these racist asshole, like, I can't believe you did that you didn't vote for her, you know, and they came around, right? What I, are there ways without sacrificing, you know, values, right? Like, are, are there ways to, you know, you said that they're a little bit scared of the left, right? And they're, and yeah. I, you said that maybe they're a little bit scared that like white men are kind of being targeted or whatever. Like, are there ways to, to, you know, distinguish, you know, the fact, uh, you know, yourself and, and Joe Biden and, and the mainstream part of the democratic party from the like lefty university types that like, that are free, that freak them out. Like, how, how do you, how do you do that? Well, I actually think that we're not going to be able to do it. Um, I think we're not going to be able to do it uh, just by uh, campaigns. I think it's you know, the way we govern, you know, showing uh, that you know, we're serious um, and you know, presenting an alternative. But I do think in our campaigns, um, we need to be as broad as possible in our messaging. Uh, and you know, I, I feel like you know, for me coming from a football background, I'm used to the idea that we can come from all kinds of different, you know, worldviews and, and, you know, backgrounds. And you come to an NFL locker room and you come, go to lunchtime, you'll see the, the countryest boy sitting next to the guy from the middle of the city uh, who are like best friends and who are, you know, going to, who are working really hard together and, and feel like they're brothers. And, and so I understand, I, I've seen these divides be bridged. Um, and, but you have to be inclusive and you have to give folks, uh, some buy-in and you, can, you just can't treat like you, do, you have to treat like you do any other, uh, you know, appeal that you're trying to make where, uh, you know, you try to appeal to values. You try to make people feel like uh, they have a home with us, but you also, I think, be honest with them and say, you know, we're not going to agree on everything, <laughs> but we're going to agree on more things. Uh, and, and this is why I think you should give us a shot. And I have said this for some time that I think in particular, uh, these are pro-democracy folks uh, who, um, and I think the biggest divide in our politics right now isn't so much between Democrats and Republicans, it's between folks who believe in our democracy and those who don't. And, you know, like a Liz Cheney or someone like that is extremely popular among, you know, my kind of, you know, the folks that we're talking about, the folks I represent. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because she took a principled stand. She's very conservative, but they respect her. And I think they, they expect that from us uh, is straight talk, you know, delivering and being inclusive as we can. Um, it, but there's always going to be a challenge there because we're a big coalition, Tim, and you know that uh, yeah. when we, we well, bring they, in a lot of different folks. One of the impeachers besides Liz, I want to ask you about is uh, you, I was listening to one of the other podcasts you did. You talked about how you're pals with Anthony Gonzalez, another former football yeah. guy. Uh, JVL is a big fantasy politics man. So I'm going to play, put on the JVL fantasy politics hat. I don't, I, I just, I genuinely don't understand. I think in a lot of cases, it's asking a lot to tell people they should change parties, become a Democrat, right? I, I get, I get it, right? Um, but in a Why? Like it's Anthony, not like renouncing your family, Tim. <laughs> it's it not is like you have to of. disown your mother and father. People, in order they to had the bumper sticker. Parties. They had the bumper sticker. Okay. So you already know where JVL's going to It's like on transferring that. schools. That's yeah. what, it's like moving from, you know, Missouri <laughs> State to the University of Missouri. That's all it is. <laughs> It's a big deal. I wouldn't transfer from LSU to Bama, okay? All right? Like, there's, there's there'd be some... <laughs> yeah, that's true. All yeah. right? Would you transfer from Baylor to UT? I don't know. There'd be some people that would be questioning you if you had that's done right. that, I think. Okay. Yeah. Gonzalez, though. Like, I, I don't know what he's doing in his life right now. So you guys are friends. De Ohio has been a tough state for Democrats. It's moving red. Like, 
you know, why can't Anthony Gonzalez just run as a red dog Democrat? Why can't he just get into a Democratic Senate or governor primary and say, hey, I haven't changed my views on anything. I'm still pro-life. I'm still for smaller government, but I want to, you know, defend Ukraine. I want to defend democracy. You know, I'm going to be a part of the, you know, I'm going to be a productive member of the Democratic caucus. I don't like, why can't somebody like that do that? Like, what, like, what, what's your, what's your view on that? Well, you want to put your Anthony, buddy on the spot right now? No, no. But knowing Anthony, um, I think you know that that's he he considers himself to be the true Republican, right? Like you know, so uh, you know he he's not he's got the old time religion, right? So uh, I think he sees himself as as probably fighting or representing what the Republican Party should be, and so I I think it's probably it would be a big leap for him to make that kind of a decision. I think on our side, uh, I think we need to be open uh, to folks who are looking for, uh, you know, to make a transition and who maybe agree with us on these values and who could be productive members. Um, you know, like the, the Senate campaign in, in Utah, Evan McMullen, yeah. you know, is a, is a similar uh, kind of circumstance. And I think you might see a stage that's reached in some of these states where that's something that that does happen. It may not be in Ohio where we still have, you know, Sherrod Brown and, and maybe folks think that we can, <laughs> I don't know, come back or <laughs> I, I hope that Sherrod gets reelected. I think he's a great Senator. Um, but you know, I, I think the the transition that you've written about Tim is still underway, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, and, let's, uh, let's go have a beer with them and just let them know the old time religion is dead. All right. He's out there. He wants the Latin mass still. Okay. Like it's over. All right. I'm it's sorry. Dead. Joe Biden is Reagan's third term. <laughs> This is. <laughs> uh, we have one more politics thing for you. Um, we might have a, a mutual kind of competitor soon, in a way, um, because me and JVL are in a podcast ratings competition with, uh, with fellow podcaster Ted Cruz. Um, who is a professional podcaster? Sometimes he's beating the bulwark in the rankings. Sometimes we're beating him. That's why people gotta rank. You know, gotta subscribe, comment, download us, so we can beat him in the podcast rankings. Um, but, uh, you might also be a competitor with him in his other, in his kind of his side hustle, uh, which is in the Senate. Um, is that something you're thinking about doing, challenging, challenging him? Yeah, I think it's such a, a funny way to pose that question. Um, because I, I do, I am personally insulted by the fact that this guy's doing three podcasts a week. <laughs> I represent, you know, a little bit less than a million Texans. He represents 30 million. I am so busy. <laughs> like, I mean, you know. On top of uh, you know being, and don't forget the shit posting. He spends, yeah, well, he spends you more time shit posting on Twitter than he does even podcasting. Posting. Yeah, I mean it's you got to feed the beast, you know. And um, <laughs> he, he's certainly he's a content machine. He's not a legislative machine. Uh, and I, th- I know many of us feel that we have one senator uh, here. Uh, when a, when a crisis hits Texas, it's going to be Cornyn who responds. Uh, for us, it's not going to be Senator Cruz, uh, and we, you know, we saw that I think very visibly when he, you know, went to Cancun during probably the worst environmental crisis that we've had in the last century. I mean, like the whole state was frozen; people were burning their fence posts to stay warm. People in my district were dying from carbon monoxide poisoning for bringing generators indoors, uh, and he decided that was the time to go on vacation. I was so busy with FEMA and other things, but the point, though, I think is that. We deserve a better senator in Texas, and I know that I'm going to play a role in in seeing us get a better senator, uh, and, and that's what I know right now. I'm right. I'm really proud of the the work I've done in Congress. I think I'm I'm getting to the point now where I know what I'm doing, and uh, you know worked really hard to get in the seat and to hold the seat, uh, and I want to see us do so much better in terms of getting folks out to vote. Tim, I, I know this is not your question, but just posit this. We had 9.6 million registered voters not vote in the last election. Okay. You know, that's more voters who didn't vote than most states have. You know, a lot of states have people, yeah. right? You know, and we just have an enormous apathy problem. Uh, and we have to address that. A lot of it's in our cities. And so we need to get folks out uh, to vote yeah, in a much higher Some of those rate. are rednecks, though. I mean, some of those are, I said it, not you, but, you know, some of those apathetic folks are non-college well, whites. No, you're right. No, you're right. Which, is not, our, which is not our target yeah. demo. Okay. Yeah. No, no, you're no, right. They're not no. all. 
They're not all going to vote for a Democrat. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, let's do some football. Sure. JVL, what do you think? Did you have anything else on Ted Cruz? Yeah. No. Let's do some football. Dude, I want to talk football so hard. Raphael. Okay. I, I, not Beto, I guess. Can I just throw that out there? Love Beto. Nice guy. I liked, he's a great journaler. Um, I loved Beto's blog, but let's try to let's try to find somebody else this time. That's I guess that's my only bias. Um, the uh, football stuff. I, the thing that really strikes me about your football career. I want to ask you about a ton of stuff, but um, is so you play at Baylor, you go undrafted, yeah. and and it's you're obviously a very talented guy. <laughs> to law school, there's you had a lot of other things you could have done, but you're like screw it. I'm going to go try to make a team as an undrafted person. Like, what is that process like? Like, what was your, what, what made you decide to do that? Uh, uh, you know, tell us, like, for those of us who have no experience with anything like this, who have chicken arms, like, what's it like to just be the undrafted guy showing up to camp, trying to make the team? That had to yeah. be crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't talk about this as much because most people, when they see that I was an NFL player, think that I you know, went to the combine, was drafted, and got, made a lot of money. I was you know, a guy who had to fight and scratch to get into the league and to stay in the league and, you know, made a career. And, and by the time I was just about to you know, maybe be able to move into a, a higher kind of echelon, I got injured and had to retire. But, um, you know, so the, the way it worked was I was going to go to law school. I had taken my LSAT. Uh, I had done well in school uh, and I was all prepped for that. And agents started calling me my senior year, saying they wanted to represent me. And I told them, you got the wrong guy. I'm going to law school, blah, blah, blah. Eventually, they have to send me my draft report saying that I, I might be a, a bottom fifth to seventh round pick. Those are the last rounds, Tim, since I know you don't follow. <laughs> no, I follow. I know. Okay, I follow. Okay. I know the rounds. Okay, so fifth to seventh round pick. Or I almost wore my Joe Burrow shirt to rub it okay, in. Good. But I, I just didn't, Burrow, I didn't feel, yeah, I didn't feel yeah. like, I felt like that was a little too on the nose, like wearing the band tee to the concert, you know, he, but he anyway, is sorry. Incredible though. Uh, or a priority free agent, which just means that after the draft's over, you get a bunch of calls. Uh, and so I didn't get drafted, uh, but I was called right after the draft by a number of teams. Um, and I thought I was going to sign with the Cowboys, which would have been great for me as a Dallas guy. Uh, they made a, an offer. We accepted the offer and they pulled the offer. <laughs> so uh, I know Jerry Jones. And then um, the ended up signing with the Titans, which was actually not a great landing spot for me because they had just drafted three linebackers in that draft. <laughs> and they had like, you know, seven on the roster. Yeah. And so, you know, come to training camp and there's like, you know, 14 of us and six of us are going to be there at the end of it, you know? Wow. Uh, and, you know, long story short, I get cut, they bring me back. I make the team and me and one of those other draft picks are the only two who are left standing at, at kind of the end. Uh, and the way I did it was that just like in any other field, you have to kind of figure out like, what's, what do you, what value do you bring to the company? Right? Like what's your niche? Uh, and for me, it was that I could play all the, the three linebacker spots. So I was a, a versatile player on the defense and I was a, a plus player on special teams. I could, I could do all the coverage, all the, all the returns. And so I could be a core special teamer and a Swiss army knife on defense. And it turns out that, you know, that's basically filling two jobs with one player in a lot of ways. And so I, my made my career is in a four, three defense where we had three starters. I was the fourth guy. If anybody got hurt, I came in. If we went to an extra linebacker set, set, I came in, um, and then played all the core special teams. And, you know, that's how I made my career. Why can I ask why you chose football? Uh, so you you played baseball and basketball. Football is, in many ways, the the sport where you are the least control of your own destiny. Because you, yeah. I forget who said this, but it, you don't just have to be the right piece. You have to be the right piece in the right puzzle in order yeah. to make a career in football. Like so much of it is just out of your control. Yeah. Uh, what it, it just you just love balling? Is that was that what it is? Just love no, the ball. I, no. I, I you know I I preferred baseball. <laughs> I wish I was a playing center field for the Rangers, you know, <laughs> like, um, I, my body type was turned out that I was, you know, six two two forty and not 180, you know? And so like, yeah. I, I just had a different kind of a body type. Cecil uh, Fielder though, had a good baseball career. That's true. Yeah, that's two... true. Yeah. You know, there's some big guys. Do you like that JVL? I haven't watched baseball in 20 years. I, I can know, do football yeah. with you, but Flaw, all my it. baseball Flaw, references are from 1992. Flaw. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I actually, my first in college, I was like, okay, I'm going to pay for my school with this. And then I thought, if I can make it a couple of years in the NFL, I'll pay for my law school with this. But when I got cut, I got really annoyed. Uh, <laughs> so I was like, 
how dare you, you know? So just to be ornery, you decided yeah. to make a career out of football. Right. And I was like, well, you know what? Now I got to show you. <laughs> and, Man. and I, I mean, I went, I worked so hard to make that team. I, I, I would do our workouts and then I'd do my own workouts. I, I, I wouldn't, didn't just study my position. I studied every position. I mean, I became like a, a coach on the field and I maximized my talent. Uh, and it took everything that I had, but it wasn't that I loved football so much. It was mostly that they had told me I couldn't do it. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to prove you wrong. And then when I, when my career was over, I, you know, I, I pretty quickly decided, okay, I'm going to law school and I didn't look back and, you know, to be honest with you, um, I, I still follow football. I enjoy watching certain players and certain teams, but you know, I'm not like a, a fan who is is following it the way a fan would. And right. I follow it kind of like from, from a professional, you know, kind of perspective. What's the biggest difference between the college game and the pro game? From like, you know, the, the uninformed spectator, all the the big difference I see is just the blind, blinding speed. Yeah. Uh, the pro game looks so like every single guy on the professional field looks like they're running basically a four six, even if they're not right. I mean, even the even the oh. offensive linemen look like they're insanely fast. But is is that the big difference, or is there other stuff? What uh, yeah. what hit you most as you were transitioning from the college to the pros? It's three things. It's uh, speed of thought. These guys think so quickly. They're professionals. We know what we're seeing. And we move, and that's why it appears that we're moving so much faster in a lot of ways. Although we are faster because we're, but the other thing is that we're, we're bigger and stronger than your average college player. Uh, and then the third thing is complexity. The complexity just goes up by you know, multiple factors. Uh, I mean, I, I think I always laugh when people think the football players are dumb because like, and they may be dumb in some, certain aspects of life. Um, but, and defensive linemen don't have to be that smart. But uh, if you're like a, a defensive <laughs> back or a linebacker, like your blitz package, it might be five blitzes, let's say. It's actually 30 blitzes because it's all dependent on formation, down and distance, and what happens even during, after the ball is snapped and the blitz can change. And so you're making split second decisions. Uh, and so I'd, I'd say the athletes are bigger and faster and stronger and they are professionals. Their job is to make their body into a, a, you know, a tool, uh, which is just different from the college level. The speed of thought though, shocked me i mean you I, I used to love watching the really great players on film like ed reed um ed reed was somebody who when the ball was snapped sometimes he wouldn't move for a couple of seconds he'd be like what the hell is ed doing because everybody else is running around like a chicken with their head cut off and he's not moving he's just watching and seeing how the play unfolds and then he would just strike and he would you know sprint 20 20 yards across the field uh, you know, have an interception and take it back for a touchdown. And it's you're like, well, how'd that happen? It's like, well, he knew from that formation that there were a certain number of routes they could run. During the route, he's like, okay, it's this route. Then he saw the quarterback. He said, okay, the quarterback's throwing there. I'm going. And so, and it looks like a, you know, incredible freak athletic play, but it's really, it was so much of it was up here. Uh, and that speed of thought, that complexity just separates it so much. Was there anybody that was just like such a physical specimen yeah. once you got out there, like somebody that that knocked you on your ass in camp or something? Where you're just like, man, I can't so even many. believe this. How is this person a human? So many, so many. I mean, the NFL is full of freaks, and I was not an athletic yeah. freak. I maximized my athletic ability, um, but the NFL has so many athletes. I mean, I could, t I could tell you endless stories. I've seen guys who literally run out of weight to lift because they just are bored. That's how strong they are. Um, but like a guy like, uh, like Albert Hainsworth, who I played with and Albert really went downhill after he left us and went to the, we Reds. remember him in Washington. Yeah. went to the, <laughs> the Redskins. Um, he, when he was playing with us, he was like, almost like, uh, when two magnets of, you know, opposite force, you know, get near each other. And like one just like goes backwards. Like that's how he was with like grown men who were offensive linemen trying to block him. <laughs> I mean, he would just pick people up with like one arm and like throw them. I like the brutality of watching him do a pass rush <laughs> is still something that to this day, I, I, I mean, he was like six, four, six, five, you know, three thirty or something and quick and strong. Uh, and, and he could, I think he could do like the splits, you know I mean? He was like an athletic freak, you know? Uh, and you know, you just think that that's what else in, in like a human shouldn't be able to do that. <laughs>
<laughs> um, you said you were talking something that hit me when you were talking earlier about the locker room vibe and having the country boy and having this everybody gets together uh, as a gay person like one thing that like football the culture around being openly gay like has been kind of a hot button right and Michael yeah. Sam tries to get in the league and you know Tony Dungy I forget who it was some other some GMs are like oh I don't know there'd be a distraction in the locker room then Carl Nassib comes out and, yeah. I, you know, I thought it was a huge deal. I did, like, my Snapchat show on it. I'm, like, tweeting about it. And, like, it barely even makes the news, right? Like, yeah. Carl, like Carl is not a household name, really, even. Yeah. And, and he's in the, he's playing in the NFL, openly gay. Like, what's your sense for that? Like, uh, obviously, there's more than one gay person in the NFL. I'm not asking you to yes. out anybody. But, like, what is yes. the – what do you think is, like, at this point, the holdup there? Like, what, yeah. what's your sense for that? Well, the NFL is kind of the last bastion of kind of the, the un, unreconstructed you know, men, like, you know, like, and a lot of it starts and begins with the owners. I mean, um, you know, you, you get a group of 32 NFL owners together and it's probably 32 of, of almost you know, maybe the worst people in the country at any given time. Um, and, you know, some of them do great stuff, but by and large, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a personality type that you are that wealthy and you want to spend your money on a, on an NFL football team. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, I played from 06 to 11 and I would say that, uh, a story like Carl Nassib's would have been a much bigger deal when I was playing than it was just five or six you know, seven or eight years later. And I think that says a lot for us about, you know, our culture and how quickly it's moved. Uh, and I'm, gl- I'm glad, uh, that, 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 that has happened, but, you know, the NFL, if you go to an NFL game um, and you sit there and, and you'll see, you know, the flames coming out and the cheerleaders dancing. And then you see, like, the guys come out and the music nice. and then the jets fly over. And, I mean, this huge is like. Huge flag. <laughs> yeah, the huge flag. I mean, this is a spectacle. And it's a spectacle that I think is in some ways kind of filling, you know, maybe a, a hole in our society that, you know, like, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, but it's. I'm sorry. I thought that, that, I've been told that the I've been reliably told the NFL has gone woke. I was and just going to say that for yeah. like years we've been told, oh, the NFL is in decline because they went woke. Go woke. Go broke. Is that not? not I think the NFL you is see? more popular than it's ever been. I mean, it's making more money than it's ever made. Uh, I do think that I get annoyed at the NFL when they do performative stuff that they don't believe in, <laughs> like, yeah, sure. like when you know when they have like a, they put like you know an end racism sign in the in the end zone. Uh, next to like the Kansas City Chiefs logo, you know, and it's like, <laughs> and it's like, a little bit of disconnect there for you. Yeah, um, mostly because I'd rather see them take actions that show what they're doing than like you know just kind of performative stuff. But no, the NFL is uh, is still you know the home of uh, you like, know, guys who can you know, legally beat each other up, right? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I got one more football kind of politics way thing. Uh, one of my hobby horses has always been, as a big college football fan, as I was mentioning with LSU, has always been um, the pair play, right? So we finally have NIL now, which I think I think is a good step. But like you lived through this, like what's your what's your sense for that? Like what do you think would be a good system? Like it is true that they're like. Well, it's true that some guys were getting bags back then, but it's also true that yeah. there are guys that, like this is the peak. Like Baylor, you know, let's say you hadn't made the pros, right? Like mm-hmm. Baylor would have, and and let's say you That's weren't a, a law school kind of guy, right? Like a version right. of Colin that is that comes, you know, that that doesn't have the skills to go do something else that's going to make them a lot of money. That is their maximum earning potential years, right? Yeah. Like at Baylor, they're the hot, they're the big shit on campus, and and they're not, and they can't, they couldn't monetize it. So, like, how do you how do you d- deal with that while also still making it be college? Yeah, well, I remember um, when the NCAA uh, football game was coming out, uh, you know, on, on yeah. PlayStation and all that. Yeah. And I would play with my player <laughs> and I had a pretty good rating. It was like for Baylor, it was okay. But like, yeah. uh, and I, I, it was like, I was an impact player and, uh, and the guy, the little character model didn't have my name, but he was born in Dallas, uh, in April, you know, <laughs> and he was six to two thirty five. you know, like yeah. it, this is me. Right. And I know that they made, just so much money on that game because we played it you know, nonstop, right? Yeah. And but we saw nothing from that. And I would walk past the Baylor bookstore uh, where they'd have my jersey selling in the window, uh, and you know you wouldn't get any piece of that either. And so, and, and I, those kind of examples always stood out to me because I remember I was so broke, <laughs> like that I, like you know, for us it'd be like, oh, 
Like if you get like a package of ramen, it was like a big deal. You know what I mean? Like uh, we were so broke, like dead broke. Like our scholarship check covered our living expenses. And if it was anything outside of that, like that was it. You know, we're talking about going to see a movie. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> couldn't afford that. Right. Uh, I didn't have any money coming from home. Uh, and even like I actually even took out a loan my senior year, a student loan, not for paying for school, just for paying for like, you know, being able to socialize. Uh, while these other things were going on. And I think that was wrong. But I also am worried about where NIL is going, particularly the combination of boosters uh, and uh, the state-by-state difference in laws. I think we have a, a potential for a race to the bottom here to where, you know, how much, Tim, really is it worth to Louisiana to have the best players of Louisiana State? A lot. A lot. I mean, it brings in a lot of money, revenue for the, for the state of Louisiana. Yeah. And there's, there's basically nothing that I would say that legislature wouldn't do to incentivize coming to LSU. But these are still kids, and they're still uh, students, and they're still very young. Uh, and so I think we have to have a balance. So I think we need to have a, you know, a federal standard that kind of sets the rules for the road. Yeah. I want to see it be like Olympians. You know, where you can be on the Wheaties box if you're an Olympian, but you're still an amateur, right? Right. Uh, you can make good money from the, the use of your name, image, and likeness. But there are certain things that uh, will be you'll be protected from. Because one of the things I've heard about is you know, these uh, agent contracts that, they're being, that are being signed with these very high commissions for these agents. There's a reason why in the NFL we limit, uh, the NFL Players Association limits agents to 3% of the contract. They can't go above that. Uh, and it's because otherwise it'll be abused, you know, and and I think we're, we're already seeing some stories of real abuse here. So I'm happy for these kids to make a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy for them to be paid more for their services that are delivering incredible value to their university. But I also want to protect them. Well, luckily, the NCAA and the Republican Congress is so functional that, that they'll sit, cl- easily come up with a system here of rules of the road <laughs> that won't be abused. Uh, JV, you got anything else on football before we go to rapid fire? Uh, you know, I'm, real quick, CTE. Yeah. How much does it worry you? Can football? I mean, look, football's a contact sport. Uh, everybody knows that they're they're putting themselves at risk, but maybe we don't know the full extent of the risk. Uh, can you manage the risk of injury to players in football to a place where it's acceptable? Do you think that is that is that possible, or is the league moving in the right direction? Is do you, when you think about CTE, do you worry more about the pros or college or like prep football yeah. with kids who aren't going to go on or, or is all of this overblown? No, it's not overblown. Um, it's a very real concern. A lot of the, the studies and research on this came out after I left the league or at the end yeah. of my career. And I always felt that since the NFL knew about it, they should have disclosed it to us. Because it's one thing to take a risk when you know about it. It's not to take, to take a risk when you don't know about it. Now, we all had stories and we all know guys who played in the 70s and 80s who were, you know, having a hard time mentally. And a lot of it was attributed to, oh, well, these athletes can't get over their football career being over. But we know now that a lot of it isn't that, that it's out of their control. And that they're trying their very best to battle something that they have no control over. Uh, and the NFL should do a much better job of taking care of those guys who built this league and the guys who are playing now, when they're done playing, and, and I get really annoyed when I see, you know, Demar Hamlin, for example, and, and we we all rightfully so felt so you know uh, impacted by his injury on national TV, and I think when that injury is over, we then you know forget that the NFL is really not going to take care of him when his career is over, you know, uh, should he have complications down the line and things like that, uh, and so I think the league should do a better job of that. I think that they have made some really important steps. JVL, the, the biggest impact hit in football when I was playing was a kickoff. Okay. Like, yeah, the kick I returns, start, right? That's why they've tried to. Do yeah. The, I would start with the 20 yard the line. Return go away. Yeah. Yeah. I would start with the 20 yard line. The kickoff was on the 30. When my, when my kicker hit six yards away from the ball, I would take off running and I would make contact again on the other 20. And I'm running full speed the whole time. Yeah. That's a big, high octane impact, right? Yeah. Uh, and they've changed that entirely and i think that's the right thing to do uh they've also limited the n- amount of hitting in practice because we've learned that it's, it's not just the concussive hits it's the subconcussive hits and, and the repetitive ones but i don't think that they can take the risk out of the game and, and these athletes are getting bigger and stronger and the field is the same size so they're hitting harder uh, and that is something that we have to just struggle with i think as, as a society 
you know, is what are we going to do with the fact that this game that we love so much is so brutal to the people who play it? All right, this has been great. We got rapid fire. We got to get you out of here, okay? Rapid fire, fun questions. You ready for this? Okay, you ready? All right, number one, Obama famously joked that uh, people wanted him to have a drink with his Republican colleagues. And he said, you have a drink with Mitch McConnell if you want to have a drink with people so bad. Which Republican colleague would you most like to have a whiskey with and which one would you least like to have a whiskey with? Oh, my goodness. I mean, least has got to be you know, probably Jim Jordan. <laughs> uh, most, I'll, I'll say my, my friend Jake Elzey. I like him. He's a good guy. That's a good follow-up. I'll do my second rap fire then to JVL on Jim Jordan. If there was a wrestling match between you and Jim Jordan, how many seconds do you think it would take for you to get a pin? Uh, Or do you think he might beat you? One second. I would pin him in a second. One second. (laughs) Jonathan. Rank the following three presidents. Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton. Obama, uh, Biden, Clinton. Well, a clear, clear answer there. Coolest football stadium you got to play in you went in there and you're like man this is this is just an unreal experience uh texas a&m had this thing where they made their stands rock the di- different directions so like it looked like the whole stadium was moving they practiced <laughs> oh, this by kyle the way field yeah yeah kyle field they practice this where they they practice you know rocking in different directions you know, in the rows and it's a, it's a bizarre thing to see from the field it's not very scary but i think it's, it's it was interesting you never played in tiger stadium though no i didn't get to play in that that i've heard is really we'll get intense. you down on the field sometime yeah. JVL, last right. one. Vince, Vince Young, the best college QB of all time? I think so. I really do. I mean, he won a national title single-handedly against probably the best team in college football history. I mean, he, the, that USC team had, what, two Heisman winners on it, how many All-Americans, how many first-round picks, really? and that Texas team was not nearly as good as they were, and he beat them on his own. Second to Joe Burrow. Disagree on that one. Okay, I lied. We got one more Maybe pre-draft. Good, pre-draft, you ran a four eight five forty. How's that looking these days? You, <laughs> you under five? You keeping it under five on, on your forty? Absolutely not. No way. No way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I got a bad back. I'm a oh, I'm a dad now. Yeah. Congressman, it's been so good. Please write us something. Write for the bulwark sometime. Let's stay in touch. Um, if you decide to do something interesting against our podcast competitor, and we have you know a mutual a mutual interest uh, in that, um, we'll keep in touch on that too we're really grateful say hi to your constituent george w bush for us we'll see all our listeners on wednesday for the regular next level with sarah and catch you back next sunday with a really cool guest peace